Well, good morning and welcome to Democracy 101 and specifically to our conversation today on politics, government, and higher education. Before we get started, I wanted to begin by thanking Stanley, Amy, and the entire team at Northampton Community College's Center for Civic and Community Engagement. Uh, they are putting on an excellent series, Democracy 101, bringing to like important conversations that our community should be having. And I'm absolutely honored to be a part of that conversation. But also they've really had to adjust on the fly in light of recent events. And so I applaud them for continuing to do this work. It's important work and I appreciate them having me a part of it. <clears throat> By way of brief introduction, for those who don't know me, my name is Samuel Chen. I have the privilege of serving as adjunct professor of political science at Northampton Community College. And while I'm not at the college, I serve as host of the TV show Face the Issues and also as the principal director of The Little Group. We're a boutique political, public policy, and communication strategy firm. And for the last 10 years, I've had the privilege of having a front row seat to America's democracy, whether serving as a staffer in both houses of Congress or advising various members, uh, legislators, and directing campaigns from local to congressional, statewide, and presidential races. And so it's combining all of that experience in addition to our look at higher education that we come to today's question, today's topic. Specifically today, I'd like to address the topic of higher education. Specifically, where do we find it today? Where is its future? And what role can and ought we play in it? In other terms, I'd like to answer the question, who is Ed and why is Ed high? So I'll approach this question in three parts. First, a look at our politics. How society conducts itself is a direct reflection of our education. As politics and education are two fields that impact everyone, how we engage our politics tells us a lot about our education system. From an outward look in, we'll move to a more introspective observation by looking at higher education from and academia from within. Society's engagement of politics may highlight the symptoms of higher ed, both successes and its shortcomings, but only looking inward allows us to assess those issues themselves. Lastly, I'll, choose, I'll close by proposing a few solutions we ought to consider pursuing in an effect, effort to improve, if not outright save, higher education and as a result, our society. So that's where we'll be taking this conversation today. Let's get started. <clears throat> education and politics both impact all of us. How we act as a society is a direct reflection on the former and thus perhaps the best observation of that is the latter. How we as a society engage our politics is quite telling of our current state of higher education. I've spent the past decade in politics. I've had the privilege of working in both houses of Congress, leading a variety of campaigns from local races to congressional campaigns to gubernatorial, statewide, and presidential elections. During that time, we've won a lot of races and we've lost some races. None of those were my fault, just kidding. <laughs> We've been the majority, and we've been the minority party. The nature of politics is cyclical. However, there are a few growing trends that are deeply troubling and show no signs of slowing down. I'll focus on two of those trends here today. The first is the lack of civility. We don't have to look much further beyond yesterday's headline or today's Twitter feed to see this. In 2016, my firm had the privilege of working with then-Ohio Governor John Kasich. Many people of all political stripes approached me during this time to express how much they appreciated the governor, largely for one reason. He was, quote, the adult in the room. While I was pleased to see the governor obtain so much support, it's not a promising trend when our support for the leader of the free world is decided by who behaves him or herself properly. Former Representative Jeff Coleman, a friend and mentor, addresses this issue of civility in his book with all due respect, recovering the manners and civility of political combat. I recently sat down with Jeff on my show, Face the Issues, 
where he explained that while we are quick to place blame at the feet of our politicians and elected officials, we, the society, shoulder no small portion of that blame. After all, we are the consumers, and in any business, the producers supply what the consumers demand. So the onus is on us as people, as constituents, to demand better. Consider the shooting of House Majority Whip Steve Scalise, a Republican, and former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, a Democrat. Neither shooting was perpetrated by a colleague or a staffer from an opposing party or camp. Or consider the GOP headquarters in North Carolina that was blown up during the 2016 campaign and the Democrats who rallied together to raise money to build that, to rebuild it. While there is certainly blame to go around, we must demand and simply be better. Tied closely to the lack of civility in our politics is the lack of thought in our discourse. We have largely replaced robust conversations with shouting matches and traded in ideas for labels, one-liners, and talking points. Consider the matter of Russia. In 2012, President Obama and fellow Democrats tore into former Massachusetts governor and Republican nominee for president Mitt Romney for citing that Russia was our greatest geopolitical threat. President Obama mockingly suggested that G Governor Romney had not realized the Cold War was over. Later that election cycle, President Obama was caught on an open mic telling then-Russian President and current Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev that he just needed to get through the election and the two nations could work closer together. Yet not four years later, the tables turn entirely with now President Trump touting his relationship with Russian leadership while Democrats decry Russia as a geopolitical threat. This conversation on Russia, the capacity for a foreign power to meddle in our elections, and how we should engage with such a foreign entity, is largely dictated by party lines and partisan talking points. This inability or perhaps absolute refusal to think through issues ideas, and arguments will allow any issue, Russia or otherwise, to become a threat to our society. We often hear that our elections are a judge of the quality of candidates we produce, and certainly there is truth to that. However, elections and our politics in general are also a judge of our society and ourselves. Remember, we are the consumers. Our engagement in the political process doesn't merely speak to our candidates, but it speaks volumes about us. In our politics today, we live at one of two extremes, either in the position of absolute political ambivalence or in a place of complete po politicization. On the one hand, we all know those who simply don't vote. And on the other hand, there are those boycotting Taylor Swift because she hasn't revealed who she voted for in the 2016 presidential elections. To quote Taylor, haters are gonna hate, 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 hate. This is where our shrinking capacity for thought and civility leaves us. Not very long ago, we had robust debates on ideas. That eventually gave way to debates on whether there were ideas to debate. And today that has given way to conversations on how to talk to each other. What our survey of today's politics and society reveals is certainly problematic, but these are still largely symptoms. And so we turn our attention toward an introspective look at higher education and academia. As with our politics, there are two primary concerns I'd like to highlight. The first is thought, picking up right where we left off in the conversation on politics. Our decreasing capacity to think is not a political problem, but an educational one. One that I believe has been exacerbated by the permeation of postmodern relativism in academia and in society today. I spell this out more in depth in a separate paper on tolerance. What is tolerance? Consider how the term is loosely tossed around today. Then consider that tolerance can only exist in disagreement. 
It is not directed toward beliefs or viewpoints, but toward people. When two individuals disagree on a particular matter, tolerance does not call for a consensus on the matter. To be tolerant is not for one individual to agree, let alone act in accordance with the other's belief. Should dialogue reach that point, it is no longer tolerance, but conversion, or more pessimistically, equivocation. Rather, tolerance calls us to be agreeable toward the person while disagreeing, however fiercely, with his or her belief. Contrary to what is relentlessly peddled, tolerance is not remotely represented by the phrase, what's true for you may not be true for me, but rather by the age-old adage, I may disagree with what you say, but will defend your right to say it. As a result, the effect of tolerance is robust dialogue and a meaningful exchange of ideas, not demands for capitulation and elementary name-calling to which our discourse has so often denigrated in society today. The latter, instead, is a direct result of the hijacking of tolerance, something more akin to coercion than to tolerance. It is done to shut down instead of open debate, to narrow instead of broaden horizons, and to shallow instead of deepen understanding. Where tolerance demands both critical thinking and human civility, its hijacking has dismissed both. Several years ago, my associate Kate Hardman and I were discussing this very issue over dinner in Washington, D.C. At the time, Obergefell v. Hodges was being argued before the Supreme Court. And Kate remarked to me that once the same-sex marriage debate was legally settled, the next great civil rights debate would move toward the classroom. It would not be a debate on any particular issue, but on a framework. More importantly, it would not be a debate that we could afford to lose. A quick look at our campuses today validates Hardeman's astute observation from several years ago. For example, consider the presence of safe spaces on our campuses today. How is a safe space safe when those holding particular viewpoints are banned to, from voicing those views or concerns? Rather, a true safe space is a space in which everyone and anyone is welcome to express their views and engage in conversation, even debate on those views. This idea of the universe, this is the idea of the university. And if we cannot have these conversations on the university campus, then where can we? When we shatter the notion of absolutes, we subsequently shatter any meaningful dialogue, and for that matter, any meaning in our pursuits. As society has largely forgotten to see the person through the cloud of partisan politics, higher education and academia have similarly lost sight of the person. Dominating the debate in higher education today is an age-old question of whether education is an end or a means to an end, namely a successful career and the perks that come with it, be it wealth, fame, power, or the like. On the one side sits academia and the concept of a liberal arts education, which is why so many, so many of our students today go to liberal arts colleges. On the other side sits an increased push for vocational education, and even within the realms of academia, a market-driven education. Yet the two sides of this debate are more similar than they let on. Specifically, has liberal education become merely one of many volumes in the market-driven education model. I am a proud alumnus of Baylor University, where we boast the nation's most interdisciplinary core curriculum, as determined in study after study from the American Council of Trustees and Alumni. While we are told that such a well-rounded education, liberal education, is for the benefit of the student, toward what end is that benefit? Do we not boast of this achievement to attract students to the university? And do students not boast of this distinction to give themselves an advantage in the market? I know I certainly did. So perhaps we're asking the wrong question. Perhaps the question is not whether education is an end or a means, but for what end is it a means? 
In other words, what is the ultimate goal of education? Who is Ed? With the shattering of absolutes in today's higher education society, it is no wonder that we view the ultimate goal of education to be a successful career. However, let me propose to you today that the ultimate goal of education is you, the student. Your development as a person, as a thinker, as a leader, is the purpose of higher education. It is, or at least it should be, why colleges exist and why you as a student choose to attend and study. Achieve this and where you go is entirely up to you. The decisions are limitless. Consider the trend of it, continue the trend of education as an ATM and the pricey one at that, I might add, and you become nothing more than the mere puppet of the market. It is no secret then that our education system has lost sight of thought and of the per and of the person and that our politics has too. Nearly 500 years ago, philosopher Rene Descartes famously embarked on a journey where he assumed nothing and questioned everything. His first conclusions were simple, that we as persons exist and are thinking things. The rest of reality is then, re re then rests upon these two truths. After decades and centuries of educational research, reform, and supposed improvements, we are fighting today for these same basic principles, that we exist as persons and that we are created to think. So where do we go from here? It is always easier to criticize a system than improve upon it. So I refuse to do the former without at least offering a few ideas toward the latter. So let me close by touching on a few of these. First, an idea for our education system as a whole. This came out of a conversation with my associate, Kate Hardiman. Debate is something we teach in college, maybe high school, and generally as an elective. Perhaps we need to be teaching debate at an earlier age. Debate is not merely the practice of arguing. If it was, we would simply encourage people to get married younger. Nor is it the spectacle we so often see on our television screens during election season. That is something more akin to theater than to debate. But it is the intricate process that begins with research, progresses to viewpoint development, and then articulation of an argument, and finally the rebuttal of an argument. Debate is a process that impacts how we think on a variety of matters, and the skills of debate will change how students learn and process in other coursework. At its core, if done right, it allows us to see ideas instead of labels and to make arguments instead of catchphrases. Personalizing the idea of debate is how you and I engage in it today. As John Locke astutely observed, we tend to be good judges of all matters except those that deal with ourselves. This is why government agents are warned against becoming personally invested in cases and why we may give good relationship advice to our friends, but somehow manage to screw up our own relationships. This is also how we think and reason, sorry, this is also how we think and is the reason I always remind my students to think with their head and feel with their heart. But how do we do that? One simple tactic is to remove the argument in any debate from the debate's surrounding context. This is not a call to take others' words out of context. Rather, doing so allows us to formulate an argument in a non-controversial setting where it is largely unaffected by our emotions. For example, how does your argument on immigration, abortion, or economics play out when applied to sports, to the culinary arts, or to the interstate commerce of cabbages? By taking a step back, we are allowing ourselves to see people as people, ideas as ideas, and arguments as arguments. We all know that there are bad arguments for good ideas and good arguments for bad ideas, or good people with bad ideas and bad people with good ideas. Our goal in dialogue and debate must be to shed light and not heat. Taking that step back allows us to do just that. 
Fundamentally, we must understand that knowledge is not understanding and understanding is not wisdom. These first two points highlight both knowledge and understanding. I would like to leave you with this thought on wisdom. If we consider that life has three main parts, there are more, but keeping this general, who you are, who you know, and what you do, then our lives are hyper-focused on the latter two portions. What do you do and who do you know? When you consider from the time you are in school to today, there is a hyper-focus on knowing the right people. Who are your friends? Who do you play with? What teachers do you have? What group are you in? Who do you date? Who do you take to prom? Who do you marry? Who writes your recommendations? Who are your references? And the list goes on and on and on. Coupled with that drive to know the right people is the question of what do you do? From what classes you take to what sports you play to are you a jock or a band geek or a nerd to what uh, summer jobs do you have? What groups are you a part of? What internships are you doing? What jobs are you taking? What does your resume look like? The hyper focus on who we know, who we know, who we know, and what we do, what we do, what we do, even influences how we interact with each other. Consider how we introduce ourselves and how we introduce each other. This is Samuel Chen. He's a television host and a political strategist who has worked for fill-in-the-blank. Yet while we are conditioned to define ourselves by the people we know and the things that we do, it is the opposite that is true. Your identity, who you are at your core, will determine the significance of every relationship that you have and the success of everything that you do. Your doing will always flow from your being. If you remember nothing else from this talk, remember this. In the, our, all our talk about focusing on the person, our society has largely lost, lost sight of precisely that. You are not the sum of things you do or the sum of the people you know. Rather, you define those things. But none of this happens and none of this matters if we don't first understand that absolutes exist and order our surroundings. If we reject this as postmodern relativism does, then none of what I've said today matters, and frankly, neither does education.